Hey, Gray City, we are so excited that you're with us on this online experience. If this is your first time, welcome. We'd love to get to know you better. You can go to wearegrace.city and fill out a connection card there. We'll help you take a next step here at Grace City. In the meantime, get ready for an amazing time together. We're going to be worshiping through music. We'll have a message for you and hopefully you will leave change. So go ahead and get your favorite beverage and, and get ready for some worship. Good morning, Grace City. We're so glad to see you here on this 4th of July weekend. If you'll stand and worship with us, we're going to go ahead and celebrate our King together.
it puts me in the fire I rejoice cause you're there too I won't be born by things I hold fast to what is true The constant transformation Then I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just the toy Into resurrection life If I join you in your sufferings Then I'll join you in your eyes And when you return in glory With all the angels and the saints My heart will still be singing My soul will be the same Christ be magnified The men in His praise arise Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified for the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified when His praise arise. Christ be magnified.
Father, we thank you for the time and for the space this morning just to come before you, to lay down our week, to lay down our month, our year, the things that we're dealing with, our worries and our anxieties, the mountains we think can't be climbed or can't be moved. Father, we lay them at your feet this morning and we just trade them for more of you. goodness and your mercy. Just give us Jesus. We love you, Father, and we love each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. You guys can be seated. Again, you're already way ahead of me. Well, good morning, Grace City. So good to see you all here. Thank you, Miss Tracy. So glad to see you all here. I hope everyone's doing good. And if you're not, that frown will soon turn upside down because you're in the house of the Lord today. Oh, thank you again. Oh, come on. That was worthy of like more of an applause. You are in the house of the Lord. There you go. Now you guys are waking up. Now you're ready. All right, well, welcome, everybody. Um, I have a few things I need to talk to you about today. First up is Connect Cards. Now, I can already hear the collective, oh, I know, but we got to tell the new people, too. So, hi, new people, welcome. I'm going to tell you about Connect Cards. Don't worry, I'll keep it fast. A Connect Card is a little card, and it's how we get you connected. That's Connect Cards. There you go. Okay, I'm just kidding. There's a little bit more information. It's in the worship guide you were offered at the front door this morning, and it's just a way for us to get to know you a little bit better. If you want to take a few seconds throughout the sermon to fill it out, we will be collecting those at the end. Um, it also has a spot on there if you just want to let us know how we can pray for you this week or maybe even sign you up for the e-blast so that you can get some more information on what we do here at Grace City. That's all on the Connect Card. How awesome is that? I think it's pretty awesome. I also have a connect QR code, a connect code, if you will. If you want to scan that, it does the same exact thing, but this way you don't have to write. Yay! You get to type. Yay! Sorry, guys. That was really Gen Z of me. I didn't mean to do that. Um, anyway, I want to talk to you about a few really exciting partnerships that Grace City is working with. So for the next month of July, we are collecting school supplies for Sorrento Elementary. So that is going to be all from now to the end of July. Thank you. Yeah, that's pretty exciting stuff. So now to the end of July, because that's what, I, that's what it means when I say through July, we are collecting school supplies. If you want to put that out in the lobby, I believe there's a giant bin that should be pretty obvious on where to put it. It will be filling up with school supplies and hopefully overflowing with school supplies. So let's make that happen. We are also bringing in, if you have any unperishable food items that you'd like to donate to Lake Care's food pantry that we also do here, you can put those items out with the coffee bar. And if you're like, we have a coffee bar? Yeah, we have a coffee bar. If you couldn't tell, I've been there a few times already today. So that's out in the lobby. If you want to put some food items out there, just let them know it's for Lake Cares and we'll get you taken care of from there. Um, also, prayers would be really appreciated for both of those things. And speaking of prayers, our youth, and especially their leaders, are going to be needing it these upcoming weeks because not tomorrow Monday, but next Monday, we embark for Passion Camp. Finally! <laughs> There you go. So that is coming up this next, or yes, next Monday through Friday. All of our students are going to be out there learning more about Jesus. And this Wednesday, the 6th, from 6 to 8, we are having a pre-passion party. It's just a chance for all of the students who are going to come together, get amped up, and get ready for what the Lord has in store for us the next week. That being said, big shout out to the Kellers, who have been hosting fun nights at their house the past few weeks. And I shout them out because they don't have to do it anymore. Yay! So no more summer nights for the rest of the summer. We will be starting Grace City students back up sometime in the school year. But for now, you get to take a nice breath of fresh air before school starts because, oh, girl, that's coming up soon. Last thing, last thing. Kids camp. Yay! Okay, fine. Kids camp. <laughs> you guys are fun. So Kids Camp is also coming up. We still need some volunteers. We could always use some extra help. And if you want to send your kids there, that's pretty cool. How do I let you know that I want to do either of those things? I'm so glad you asked. That's what a Connect card is for. Just a little example if you want to, if you want to fill that out in there. We'll collect those at the end with the offering. All right, I think that's everything. So if you want to take this time to stretch, we'll be right back.
Well, good morning, friends. How's everybody doing this morning? You good? Are you ready? You ready? I'm ready. Okay, somebody was ready. Um, somebody was very ready. I love it. Um, I see a lot of festive people in the mood. There's some fireworks this weekend. Um, I, too, I wore my red socks just to, just to join you in that. Um, that was weird. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's Fourth of July weekend, and uh, we're so glad that you've chosen to spend this time um, with us this morning. Um, as we get started, I would love for you, we're going to be in um, Matthew chapter 6, um, but how about we start with prayer, and how about we pray collectively? Um, let's pray together. We'll put it up on the screen, um, commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, can we pray this together, out loud together? Is that cool? On the count of three, uh, one, two, three. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, we kicked off a new series last week, uh, How to Pray. And if you've ever wondered that, you've been like, how exactly do you pray? It's a great question. It's one actually the disciples um, asked Jesus as well. In Matthew 6, he kind of breaks down his answer. He first, uh, as Pastor Thomas shared last week, he first says, like, here's how don't pray, and then here's how to pray. Um, so I want to review a little bit. We're going to jump into the next section of it this morning. Uh, but before we do, just a little bit of a recap from last week, plus uh, um, uh, the blanket I stole from my son's bedroom and um, the baby pets I borrowed from my buddy Toby and Mickey uh, for this week. Um, but Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, it says, And when you pray, this is Jesus speaking. He says, And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. That phrase is important, to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. If that's what you're looking for, Jesus says, if you're looking for attention, if you're looking for people to notice it, then if that's what they're after, they'll, they'll find it. And as Pastor Thomas shared last week, prayer starts with the posture of our heart. He's like, hey, when you're praying, don't pray like them. Don't, don't pray like the people that just love to impress other people with their prayers. Don't pray like that. And he says, but when you pray, verse 6, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, um, I have a, a, a several friends um, that have taken this verse, and they, they've really tried to apply this. And I love uh, the way they've done this. There's even been movies um, about this, about the idea of a prayer closet or a war room, right? Um, that you, a set-aside place in your home, um, usually a closet or something like that. And, and, and specific prayer requests up and praise reports and stuff like that. And I love, absolutely love um, that people have, have chosen to, to create space, intentional space, uh, to focus and connect with God. Um, and that is awesome. The verse, though, actually means something even more awesome. Um, can I just, like, that, that uh, uh, picture, that image that's given right there, there's something lost a little bit in translation and a little bit in culture. Um, see, it, this is not an official talit. This is not an official Jewish prayer shawl. Um, but in Judaism, uh, as in Jesus was Jewish, right, um, they would have these prayer shawls, right? And they were called talits, and they'd have fringes and tassels and stuff on them. In the prayer closet, when they would pray, the prayer closet would be this, um, you would take it and kind of put it over your head like a tent. And, you would, and when you would close up the door to your prayer closet or your prayer tent, you would be like this. So is it the way, even when you're collectively praying with everybody, it was a way to, to kind of block out every distraction from the outside world. Um, this one's a little small, so you can still see my shiny bald head through it. Um, but you get the idea, right? Like this idea of um, even when we're praying corporately, Jesus says, when you do, when you're praying, you're not trying to impress everybody else. I mean, even this prayer that Jesus prays, that we just pray together, it's a corporate prayer, right? There's a lot of us in there. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Give, give us today our daily bread. But Jesus says when you're praying, you can, even when you're in a crowd of people, even when you're praying collectively, you're not praying to be seen, 
But even in that moment, you're connecting and trying to eliminate the distractions from your mind and your heart and this need to impress others and just connect right here. Just you and God and block out the rest. Uh, John Wesley, I believe it was, um, his mom had, had 19 kids. Oh, Lord. We can just pause there. <laughs> Um, and Wesley rep- reports that uh, she would uh, take her apron and, and just sit down when she pr- she'd take her apron that she'd be cooking in the kitchen and just put it over her head just to block out. And that was her prayer clause. That was her prayer space. She's like, I need to pray. And you, when you have 19 kids running around, I prefer like um, earbuds that block out sound and, and soundproof. Clause. But just put that apron over her head so she could spend some time with prayer. The reason I say it's even more awesome is because what that means is you can, no matter where you're at, no matter how busy you are in the middle of your day, in the middle of a crowded area, that moment where you can just stop and you can create space right then, right there, a mobile space where you can connect with God and pray. And so Jesus says, don't pray to impress others. But even when we're gathered, this is a special, this is, we're praying uh, corporately, collectively, but we're also, it's just, it's just really, really an audience of one that I'm seeking to connect with. In verse seven, he says, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, uh, people that don't believe, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. The word babbling there, um, it's an onomatopoetic word. Uh, and it's similar, it even sounds similar in Greek than it does in English, like blah, blah, babble, babble, babble. In Greek, it's like blah, 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 blah. Uh, um, Adam Sandler, I don't say blah, 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 Jesus. Yeah, you kind of do, right? Like it's don't go on babbling and just saying things. It's, it's not about the words that you're saying as much as the heart that's behind it. Prayer starts with what? The posture of your heart. If you're just saying things to say things, we're missing the point entirely, Jesus says. And if you want to pray like Jesus, knowing that, Knowing what you're saying and who you're saying to is crucial. Uh, Verse eight, do not be like them, Jesus says, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Verse nine, this is where we were last week. This then is how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your name be holy. Um, If you go to a Jewish synagogue, you'll see an inscription over the door. Uh, Here's um, several pictures, and you'll notice the Hebrew uh, if you look at it, you don't have to read Hebrew to notice that they're all the same, aren't they? These inscriptions, it's all the same in all four of those pictures. As you would enter into this place of worship, um, this inscription is what you're greeted. It's a reminder as you're walking into it. And what it says is simply this, know whom before you stand. That as you're entering into this place of prayer to know who it is you're talking, know what you're saying, but know who you're talking to. And so Jesus begins his prayer. And what does he say? Don't just go babble. Don't just go, go say words or to impress other people. What if our prayers can move beyond simple routine, rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub? What if our prayers can move beyond, O oh, the, uh, thine uh, Lord of hosts. Oh man, he's such a great prayer. What if our prayers could move beyond just a laundry list of bless me, bless me, bless me, give me more, God. But if our prayers looked a little bit more like Jesus, and Jesus says the first step, and this is what we covered last week, the first step is to know who you're praying to. Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, even your name is holy. You are the Holy One, our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. Um, now, my buddy Toby, uh, he's actually out this weekend, um, but normally you would find him in the back in the sound booth. Um, Toby uh, has three things that he absolutely loves. Um, the first is using his gifts and abilities to, to serve others in worship. Um, he helps mix the sound. He's been here late nights and early mornings, um, hanging stuff, running cables. Um, he's just one of those awesome guys that we get to have as part of our tech crew. Um, he and Zach and um, Gavin and Jackson and Michelle and so many others that, um, and Caden um, that serve in that kind of way, right, behind the scenes. Um, Toby loves using his gifts to serve. Toby also loves fireworks. Um, 
And he got so good at it that, that he started getting contracted to leave, lead him in community. So he's actually away, a contracted. He's doing the big fire workshop. I forget which city he's at this week. Um, doing that for them this weekend. Um, the third thing that he really, really loves is something that I'm a little less in love with, and that's snakes. Um, but uh, for the purpose of this morning, I was, you know, reading up and about baby snakes and, and, and mommy snakes and daddy snakes. You need to understand how all that works. And then baby snakes. And so I asked Toby, I was like, buddy, can I just borrow? He had a couple little hatchlings recently. Right? Like, I'm not a huge fan of snakes, but I'm just, I, I wanted you to see this because there's something, okay. I wanted you to see, it's not like, they're, they're small. I don't like snakes. <laughs> um, can you see them? I, hey, I just don't want to, maybe come on. Can you guys get on the camera? They're, they're not that big. Okay. <laughs> but I want you to be able to see just how wiggly these things are. Are. <laughs> so. <laughs> now, <laughs> how many of you knew I didn't have a snake in here? Right, because you know me, right? Not everybody put their hand up. The reason you didn't put your hand up is because you know me. <laughs> Jesus in Luke, in the parallel passage to what we just read, in Luke, Jesus is talking the same thing. It's the Our Father prayer. But immediately after, he says this. He's like, here's why you can pray to God as Father. And here's why it's good for you to know this. Luke eleven eleven. He says, which of you fathers, if your son asked for a fish, will give him a What? I brought some goldfish as a peace offering. Just, sorry, I hit you with a little bit of force with the, with the snake there. But which, like, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, you're like, ha ha, I'm going to give him a snake. Instead. No, of course not. She's like, don't you know what the father's like? Or verse 12, or if he asked for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? Like, <laughs> no. I thought about throwing eggs, but that could have gotten messy. Oh, that had a, that had a curve on it. I'm going to just throw the whole box. Okay, I give up. Um, of course not. And then listen to this. I love this verse, verse 13. If you then, dads... Though you're evil. <laughs> like, Dad, you're a mess. Let's just be honest, all right? You know, if, which of you fathers would do that? Well, even if you, you're not, you're kind of messed up and you mess up a lot. You do a lot of things wrong. But even you know how to give good gifts to your children. Well, how much more is a perfect heavenly father going to give good gifts to you? I mean, here's the thing. Here's what Thomas said last week. And this is where we ended. It's because God is our Father. You can trust Him. Like, do you know what God's like? Don't just walk in and into the space of worship and prayer and just without realizing, know whom before you stand. That He is a perfect Father that loves you perfectly and you can trust Him. And we've been talking with Father's Day and with starting this prayer last week, um, just the acknowledgement that not every dad not all of us had great situations, and maybe that, even that word is painful for you. But can I tell you, he is a perfect father. He's a father to the fatherless. Know whom before you stand, and you stand before a perfect father that loves you perfectly. And even, even earth dads, even a guy like me who's an imperfect guy, I'm evil, I'm a mess, right? Even imperfect dads still try to do kind things for their kids. And she's like, how much more do you think God wants to bless you? And you don't even have to tell. He already knows what you need even before you say it. Know whom before you stand. This is a father that loves you and loves you perfectly. It's the perfect father. He's a good, good father. This is who you are. Sorry. Just had a moment there. 
Know whom before you stand. Verse nine, Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. Father in heaven. God, even your name is holy. You are so amazing. He's so great and he's so good. He's our father. Your kingdom come, verse 10, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what I want to key in on today. We're just going to take this line. We're going to look at it for a couple minutes and wrestle with it for a couple minutes. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As we prayed this at the beginning, many um, in the room were you, you, either reciting it or reciting it, but also looking just to make sure, um, reciting this prayer together, right? You've heard this pray, uh, prayer this phrase, if you've been in church a lot or if you grew up in church, maybe if you were in a more liturgical church, um, maybe really regularly, uh, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, Jesus himself, uh, 98 times in the gospels, Jesus uses this word kingdom. It's the message, it's the sermon that he kept preaching over and over and over and over. A um, couple of uh, months ago, um, somebody was asking in the back, like, hey, what's, what, what, what are you preaching on this morning? What's the sermon on this morning? I'm like, Jesus loves you. And was one, of the, the, um, one of our staff just said, that's the sermon every week. I'm like, yeah. It's like we're always eating chicken. It's just different seasoning sometimes. It's grilled sometimes. It's fried. Sometimes. It's like, yeah, that's, that's it. It's, it's, it's this amazing God that loves us. And Jesus' sermon, the one that he preached over and over and over, was the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, Matthew 4, 17. If you just go a couple uh, pages back, um, it says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the sermon that he would just preach over and over and over. 98 times in the gospels, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. And here he says, as he begins, he says, a lot of times you'll see this word repent with it. And that might have heavy, like, religious connotations, you know, being in church. Um, the word is metanoia, is the Greek word. It's translated repent there. And it literally just means this. Um, actually, this is cool. It's, it's a combination. It's a compound word, two words. Meta, meaning changed after being with. And noia, um, to think. Meaning, I've been with Jesus, and now I think differently. And my whole way of thinking is different. It's changed. My, my whole way of processing this world is different. Why? Because I've been with Jesus. And, and Jesus says, repent. Because the kingdom of heaven is here. Change your way of thinking. Go away thinking different. Go away viewing this world differently. Go away viewing God and yourself and others differently. Because the kingdom of heaven is right here. It's, it's, it's at hand. Um, Mark 1, 14 through 15. Um, Jesus says, uh, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. He's proclaiming the gospel. And what's the gospel that Jesus preached? The time has come. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. What's the good news? He just said it. Repent, change your way of thinking because the kingdom of God is here. Uh, Luke Chapter 8, verse 1, after this, Jesus traveled around from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of what? The kingdom of God. It's the sermon he preached over and over and over. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. And sometimes it was confusing. Sometimes he would say stories like, the kingdom of God, you know what it's like? Um, it's like a guy who would go and he sold everything he had uh, for this plot of land because he knew there was something really valuable there. Or the kingdom of God, you know what, it, what it's like? It's kind of like um, leaven and dough and, and, and it's there. You don't even see it, but, but it starts working. It changes and it works its way through the whole thing. You know what the kingdom of God is like? And he would tell these stories about what the kingdom of God was like. And sometimes it's hard to kind of wrap your mind around it. I love this um, encounter in Luke 17. It said once on being asked by the Pharisees, well, when's the kingdom of God going to come? Jesus replied, the kingdom of, of God is not something that can be observed. Um, the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is. Why? Because it's already here. Because the kingdom of God is in your midst. And so if that's the case, here's my question for you this morning. What is the kingdom of God? In Matthew, it's referred to as the kingdom of heaven, as we just got the prayer. Mark and Luke, it's the kingdom of God. Same thing, synonymous. What is this kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of heaven that Jesus kept talking about over and over and over? The, the, the sermon that he preached, he's got one sermon he preaches over and over. And what is it? The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. 
The prayer that he says, this is how you should pray. Father in heaven, this amazing father, here's what we're praying. May your kingdom come. What does that mean? What is the kingdom of heaven? You already know the answer. You're saying, no, I'm not sure I do. What's the root word of the word kingdom? King. The concept is, is pretty simple, a kingdom. In your Bible, it's listed over and over as kingdom. Greek word is basileia, but it means that, um, kingdom. The place where a what? A king rules. That's it. So Jesus says, you, you know, you're looking for the kingdom. Is it here? Is it here? When is it coming? He's like, no, no, it's already present because I am ruling and reigning in some places. But... We're asking God for his kingdom to come and and his will to be done here to rule and reign in my life, in my heart, in my family, in my home, in my country, in my community. For Jesus, for, for your rule and reign in my life, what would it look like for Jesus to be on the throne of your life? In our community. King Jesus. Uh, Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Paul writes and says, he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. He's rescued us from the upside down (laughs) and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Paul's reflecting. He's like, you know what Jesus has done? You were a part of a kingdom of darkness, but he forgave your sin and he rescued, saved, redeemed you from that, bought with his own blood, bought with his own life and his own sacrifice. He says, fine, I'll take it all on me. I'll be the sacrifice. Rescued out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus who purchased our freedom, forgave our sins. On the one hand, it seems so simple, doesn't it? On the other, it just seems like we miss that over and over. And, and they missed it in the New Testament. They missed it in the scripture. Philip Yancey, um, uh, Philip Yancey said this, the word kingdom meant one thing to Jesus and quite a different thing to the crowd. Jesus was rejected in large part because he did not measure up to a national image of what Messiah was supposed to look like. See, they had all sorts of expectations about what king, what the king of Israel, what this promised king was going to look like. And Jesus, you're, you're not fit in the mold. Let me give you a couple of examples just from history and from um, biblical history. Uh, Hanukkah, right before the New Testament, the intertestamental period, um, you had the, uh, these guys, the Maccabees and um, uh, they were ready, like, okay, we're tired of having our, our country is getting beat up. We need to take our country back. We need to get rid of these Romans, and we're going to rise up. And so they'd go, and then they had eight crazy nights. There's a candle involved, Hanukkah. Hanukkah is the story of revolting against this foreign government and this foreign, uh, the, to fight for our physical, political freedom right here. And so the expectation grew and grew like, okay, this promised king is going to come and he's going to lead us into freedom. And so, all right, pick up your swords. Are you guys ready to go? There's this group in the, um, uh, that kind of hover in the background of the New Testament. You hear about the Pharisees a lot, but there's, uh, and the Sadducees, but there's also this other group. It's the Zealots. Uh, Simon, one of Jesus' disciples, was referred to as Simon the Zealot. Judas Iscariot was a Zealot. And there's others, Zealots. Zealots, um, similar today, they, these were the OG Zealots. Uh, these guys uh, were like, okay, we're ready to take, take it back. In the name of God, we're going to take back our, our country. And so we're just going to go and kill people. And so they were like specialists in guerrilla warfare. It's like, ha ha. <laughs> They'd sneak around. I mean, this is, this is what they did. It helps to explain Palm Sunday, right? Palm Sunday, if you ever uh, are like me, you're like, whoa, what happened between Palm Sunday and Good Friday? Like, Hosanna to the king, Good Friday, and eh, kill him. What happened? Like, Hosanna, the, 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 the expectation is like, okay, here comes this big king. Here comes King Jesus. Is it now? Is it the time? The disciples keep asking over and over, hey, is it time? 
Are you going to restore Israel? Like, are you ready? Come on, Jesus. Like, it's time to go do king things. We need to go conquer Rome. We need to go conquer these. Let's go do it. And she's like, no. His, he, instead of a stallion, rides in on a donkey. They throw a robe on him. Um, instead of a crown of gold, he's got a crown of thorns. He's like, Jesus, what kind of king are you? Instead of ascending onto a throne to rule, he ascends up onto a cross to die for everyone. And one of my, the funniest parts of it to me is the only, I mean, the only miracle we have in those last, I mean, apart from the crucifixion and resurrection, but the only miracle we have in those last, like, few days that we have recorded is what? One of Jesus' followers is like, hey, it's time, Whoops. cuts off a dude's ear, and Jesus like, Ugh. picks up the ear and does a reverse Vincent Van Gogh and glue, look. stop it. Put the sword away. Can you, like, you can understand, Peter, like, isn't this what we're supposed to be doing? You're the king. It's kingdom time. All right, it's time to go. I got my sword. Let's go. No. Why? Because Jesus is a very different kind of king, and he's a very different kind of kingdom. I mean, all their expectations are uh, overthrow this big political um, governmental structure. John 18, 36, Jesus is being questioned before he's crucified. Jesus says, look, and Pilate's like, hey, are you a king? I hear rumors you're a king. Your little thing, sign above your cross is going to say king. Are you a king? I don't see your kingdom. And Jesus says, um, my kingdom's not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. Yeah, Peter just cut off an ear. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, we... we but no, my kingdom's different. My kingdom is from another place. It's the kingdom of heaven. And here's the big caution this morning. Here's the big takeaway I want to give you. Be careful that you don't confuse his kingdom with yours. That's the biggest, that's just the caution I want to give this morning. And I want to twist it. Just, I just want to make sure, drive it home really deep this morning, to be careful not to confuse your kingdom and his. Your will be done and his will be done because it's very easy to do. Tim Keller, a uh, pastor, he wrote The Reason for God. Um, he's a pastor in New York for a couple decades. He said, when the church as a whole is no longer seen as speaking to questions that transcend politics, and when it is no longer united by a common faith that transcends politics, then the world sees strong evidence that Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx were right, that religion is really just a cover for people wanting to get their way in the world. That's coming from one of the most conservative and respected pastors in our country. It's like when we... When we stay, when we don't engage in conversations that transcend that, if we just get stuck in the muck, all it does is reinforce what other people have been told, like, oh, it's just about power. He's like, well, yeah, we're just playing right into that. Religion is just a cover for that. Be careful not to confuse his kingdom with yours. Barbara Brown Taylor, Jesus was not killed by atheism and anarchy. You ever think about that? Jesus was killed by a law and order allied with religion, which is always a deadly mix. Beware those who claim to know the mind of God and who are prepared to use force if necessary to make others conform. Beware those who cannot tell God's will from their own. Be careful you don't confuse your kingdom and his. C.S. Lewis wrote Mere Christianity. Said, he observed this, almost all crimes of Christian history have come about when religion is confused with politics. Politics, which always runs by the rules of ungrace, allures us to trade away grace for power, a temptation the church has often been unable to resist. I mean, how many decades ago is that that he wrote that? But it feels like it hits a little extra hard today. Be careful not to confuse his kingdom with yours. 
A couple years ago, my buddy um, Ryan, uh, I saw him this week, actually. My buddy Ryan uh, was telling me about a movie that I hadn't seen. Um, uh, the movie was called Kingdom of Heaven, which seems pretty appropriate for this morning. Um, Kingdom of Heaven. And I was like, no, nah, I don't. And he's like, dude, you need to see this movie. And I said, why? He said, because God wills it. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> See, the movie, The Kingdom of Heaven, it's all about the Crusades. And, and um, the key meme, the phrase that, that the, the popes and the, they're like, God wills it. And so all the soldiers are like, all right, God wills it. Let's go kill everybody. What's interesting about that is if you go back and you study the Crusades, yeah, that's, I mean, there's some liberties taken, but that was pretty much what was going on. The pope said, hey, um, your sins will be forgiven if you go kill some Muslims. And, and by 1280, uh, you had Pope Innocent, the name is ironic. Pope Innocent sent out a decree, hey, it's okay to torture people, it's fine. That's a far cry from my kingdom's not of this world, my, my, my people aren't picking up weapons. Because here's the, the, the truth, is that we can take anything that we, um, any purpose that we have, anything we're passionate about, and just spray paint a red cross in front of it and be like, God wills it! God wills it! We have to be very careful that we don't confuse his kingdom with ours. His ways are not our ways. That we don't mistake our will for his will. And so here's my question. What does his kingdom look like? Uh, Isaiah 11, um, the prophets give us glimpses of what his kingdom looks like. Um, Isaiah 11 says, the wolf will, lie, uh, will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The little child will lead them um, reminds me way too much of Ricky Bobby, but we'll just keep going. No, what's it a picture of? Peace. It's a picture of peace. And some child will be born that will lead them into this way of peace. Verse 9, they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You want to know what it's going to look like? Peace, and everyone's going to know God. No, experience the goodness of God. Uh, Micah chapter 4, another glimpse of the kingdom. It says, he will judge between many peoples, King Jesus, and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. We're not there yet. But that's where we're going. That's, that's, what, that's the trajectory. That's what we're aiming for. That's what we're praying for. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. You don't need weapons anymore. A nation won't take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. They'll take their guns and beat them into garden tools because they're not needed anymore. King Jesus, this, the glimpses of what his kingdom look like. And Jesus invites us and says, look, you're looking for the kingdom, Pharisees. Remember, they're like, where's the kingdom? Where's the kingdom? Is it coming? Is it now? And he says, it's already here. Do you not see it? Or maybe a different way to say it is, do you see that I'm really the king, the true king, the prince of peace? And my kingdom is not like all these world kingdoms and earth kingdoms that you think it is and that you try to shove it into this box. Jesus tells them, no, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is very different. When Jesus rules and reigns, it looks very different. King Jesus. Craig Keener uh, said this, if the kingdom were wholly future, one might despair of accomplishing any justice now. If one supposed that it were wholly present, the realities of this age would quickly terminate that elusive utopianism. But because the Gospels affirm that in Jesus the kingdom is present in a hidden way, believers can make a difference in their world now. A sober, sobering thought. It's here and it's now and it's coming and we're praying for it. It's this combination of both asking Jesus 
Uh, may your kingdom come and your will be done. But this prayer is also a centering prayer and aligning prayer of aligning our hearts with him. Jesus, may your kingdom come and your will be done. Your will, not mine. Your ways, not mine. Your will be done. Your kingdom, not mine. Your priorities, not mine. Jesus, build your kingdom. It's in aligning my heart with his and his ways and his will and building his kingdom. Asking and aligning. Uh, May your kingdom come right here and right now. Jonathan Lehman said, Christians are heaven's ambassadors. Our churches are its embassies. Neither panic or triumphalism becomes us. A cheerful confidence does. We represent this heavenly kingdom, whether the skies are cloudy or clear. And Paul talks about it over and over. Philippians 3.20, he says, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. This weekend, there will be fireworks. I will be enjoying some fireworks with friends this weekend. And we celebrate that we are part of this um, really cool country. We recognize there was a sacrifice that was given to, to be able to have the freedoms that we have. But Jesus, may we never forget that it's one nation under God that my ultimate loyalty is not to this nation. When I die, my soul is not going to Washington, D.C., and neither is yours. My citizenship, present tense, is in heaven. When I, um, my my family traveled for our anniversary, um, Thomas mentioned it last week, when I entered into the Dominican Republic um, and got to hang out on the beach, and we renewed our vows and all that. There wasn't a moment where we're like, well, we're no longer U.S. citizens. We're actually, no, we, we were just temporarily there. Our citizenship was in this country. And Paul says, no, 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 Jeremy, your citizenship, Jeremy, is not here. Your citizenship is part of a different kingdom. You're a temporary resident here. You're just visiting for a little bit. So live like it. And set up little embassies everywhere. <laughs> Little bits of heaven coming, um, places where Jesus rules and reigns. Guys, I want Jesus to rule and reign in my heart. I want Jesus to rule and reign in my marriage. I want Jesus to rule and reign in my home. I want my heart to be aligned with him, not my, my agenda and my things. I'm But Jesus, what, where, what breaks your heart, Jesus? I mean, it's a common thing that we just did this the other day. Thomas and I were talking about a situation, and it's like, How would Jesus react in this moment? Because if he's ruling and reigning in my life, if he's teaching me to love like him and live like him, if I'm praying like him, how do I live this out right here, right now? Your will, your ways, your kingdom, not mine. I'm just an ambassador. I'm just, I'm just your representative. Uh, First Peter, Peter says the same thing. You, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. They're like, what do you mean we're a holy nation? We live in Sorrento. This is true. When we were talking about the name of the church, some people were like, wait, I'm sorry, you call it Grace City, but you're in the middle of Sorrento. Is it its own zip code? I wanted to get our own zip code. (laughs) But it's like, no, the idea is like, man, what if this place, when you walk in these stores and we know whom we're standing before and we recognize and we discuss things that transcend just politics and our hearts and our passions are aligned with his and we ask him, God, build your kingdom and use us, build your church, build your kingdom right here in our community. Um, Peter says, you are a holy nation, God's special possession. You may declare the praises of him who called you out of that kingdom of darkness into his wonderful light, the kingdom of his dear son. Your kingdom, your will, your ways, not mine. Team's gonna come on up and we're gonna close in just a second. I'll leave you with one more thing. Um, uh, one of the most manly man movie, forgive me, manly, if you, anybody's allowed to like this, but I feel like this is just a testosterone overload movie and somehow the guys are wearing skirts. <laughs> Braveheart. It's not a knock, it's a kilt, I know. It didn't mean to offend you if you're Scottish. First time I ever, I knew a guy that was Scottish and he showed up in church in a kilt and I was like, as a fourth grader, that was really confusing. I didn't understand kilts. Braveheart. That was the tangent that I got derailed on. Braveheart. One of the, um, the characters in Braveheart is Robert the Bruce. Uh, here's his character in the movie. Um, 
Looks like he's receiving some bad news right there. Um, Robert the Bruce. Robert the Bruce in the film is known uh, for betraying William Wallace. Remember Mel Gibson's character? Freedom! Gibson shed a tear right now. Freedom! Robert the Bruce is known in the film as betraying him, but after William Wallace dies, history tells us Robert the Bruce led the Scots to their freedom. He fought and led the Scots to their freedom. On his, um, um, on his deathbed, this king, the Scotland, uh, he, he wanted his heart to continue to go into battle. And so he asked on it, this is a little graphic, he asked on his deathbed to have his heart removed, legend has it, and to be carried with one of his soldiers, uh, one of his good friends, one of these knights, um, Sir James Douglas. And so Sir James Douglas took his heart, boom, 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 ew, and wore it around his neck as he would go into battle. God was it! Yeah, right. He would carry it around his neck as he would go into battle. And legend has it that they were, there was one battle in particular where it was clear they were uh, flanked on every side, they were outnumbered, the, the, they're, they're going to go down. And, and Douglas takes off the satchel containing the heart of the king and throws it and, and follow. Here's what he said, actually, forward, brave heart, as ever thou were wont to do. And Douglas will follow his king's heart or die. Follow the heart of your king. He throws it out there, man, go follow the heart of your king. And this prayer that we have starts with a recognition that I can let go of everything. I can entrust it to him. Why? Because he's a good, good father. He's not going to give snakes. He's a good, good father. And the prayer that follows is a prayer of asking and aligning. God, may your kingdom come. May your will be done. I want to follow your heart. I want to follow the heart of your, I want Jesus lead me in this conversation. Lead me as I, as I wrestle with this and as I'm doing battle, not against people. Paul makes it really clear, not against flesh and blood, but I feel like I'm just fighting through, I'm fighting through misunderstandings or I'm fighting like, man, I feel like people are out to get me right now, or I'm fighting through all these trials and stuff that I'm going through. And my weapons are prayer and my weapons are peace and my weapons are, and, and Jesus says, hey, follow my heart. Take my heart with you and follow the heart of your king. May your kingdom come, Jesus. Your will be done, not mine. Can we pray together? Jesus, we again recognize you as our King. God, forgive us for these moments when we've walked in without realizing who we're standing before. This person that loves us and gave everything for us and rescued us and the King and the Lord of our life, the King of the universe, he calls me his friend. Jesus, I pray that that would be indeed our prayer that we'd be shaped by your words and we'd shaped, we'd pray like that. That your kingdom would come. That you'd start in my own heart, God. That we carry your heart with us. That you'd take up residence right here in our lives. That you would rule and reign. God, may we be ever so cautious of taking our agenda and our desires and throwing a cross on top of them. No, we want to follow your will and your way, Lord. Teach us, guide us, correct us. God, may we resist those temptations because it's your kingdom and your power, your glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The moment our ushers are going to come by and we're going to we're going to sing one more song of worship about Jesus and his kingdom, celebrating our king. Um, if you didn't get a chance to fill out the connect cards, uh, take a moment real quick. We'd love to pray for you, encourage you, celebrate with you. Um, 
It's also our opportunity for those of us that call Grace City home um, to give our offerings. And it's just another area of my life that Jesus rules and reigns over. And so we give joyfully um, because he's been good to us. Um, with that being said, will you stand, will you join us? Let's sing and let's worship him together.
Well, we've been given this one day, this one life, this one experience to let the kingdom come and let God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, every single space that we get to be part of. And so that is a great opportunity for us to be sent out with. Amen. And so before you head out for the day and experience all the goodness that is this 4th of July weekend, don't forget to go check out the kids' camp area and sign up a volunteer, get the kiddos part of that, or grab a cup of coffee on the way out. But in the meantime, we love you. Go and be the church with everything that you have right where you are. We love you. See you next Sunday. What a life-giving message. We're so excited that you've joined us today, and we hope that you can take some next steps with us. And so you can go online at wearegrace.city and fill out any forms that are there. You can uh, decide to get baptized with us. We can pray with you. Whatever a next step looks for you, we want to be part of that journey. Uh, In the meantime, we hope that you can go and be the church with everything that you have right where you are right now. We'll see you next Sunday.